fellow in the Cognition and Philosophy Lab at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and her presentation is entitled The Self in Action. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right. Uh, so thank you again for that beautiful introduction and for inviting me to give a keynote today. I'm really honored uh, by the invitation. I'm speaking to you today from Monash University in Melbourne, uh, Australia. I've had to get a special legal permit to uh, leave my home since we're still in lockdown. Uh, we're the city with the longest lockdowns uh, cumulatively so far since the beginning of the pandemic and we're coming up on 260 days uh, this week. So uh, if my word finding is poor, it's because I haven't talked to people in a long time. Um, but I hope today that I'll give you an engaging presentation anyway. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk to you about my work on, on the self in action, particularly, uh, and a little bit about uh, the, role, the role this plays in autism spectrum conditions. Let me get my in terms of the... So what I hope is a kind of common knowledge or understanding for today's audience, um, the predictive processing framework uh, says that the brain models the world to minimize prediction error and maintain homeostasis or resist entropy. Um, minimizing prediction error is about matching our expectations with our sensory input from the world. And this is supposed to explain both perception and action. So it's a very unifying theory compared to most cognitive uh, uh, understandings of cognition. Um, most understandings of cognition wouldn't tie perception and action under one theory. So it, it's kind of provides new and exciting ways in. Um, but most people who talk about predictive processing or active inference don't talk about the self. And I was happy to hear that uh, some of the conversations happening in the audience, but in the break, uh, people were talking about agency and the self. So hopefully this fits in nicely with what you've been talking about today so far. Um, I want to say that if you don't care about selves, if you don't build yourself into your model of hidden causes, then you're probably going to fail miserably at minimizing prediction error. Because um, our selves, our deep, the deep hidden causes in our, in our cognitive architecture, as well as our bodies and things like that, uh, cause a lot of sensory input. And so in order to properly account for the sensory input that's coming in, we also have to model ourselves. And what do I mean by a self? Uh, what kind of representation am I talking about? I am talking about things like your body, um, your internal states, the size and shape of your body and how your materiality kind of interacts with other physical things in your world, but also your past experiences, which you might, some of them become conscious priors, um, also the likely future states of your organism um, and how you're going to get there. So what kinds of policies you'll infer likely um, in order to achieve the likely future states of your organism. Um, and also how effectively you minimize prediction errors. So are you really good at the job that your brain does or, or not so good? Um, the self then is a, an inferred hidden cause um, and it's therefore malleable, just like any other hidden cause is subject to incoming information um, and we learn about ourselves every day of our lives. Um, perhaps uniquely, it's a reflexive record it's a reflexive representation, uh, which means that the thing that's doing the representing is also the thing of being represented. Um, it's also maybe one of the deepest hidden causes, the most temporally extended hidden causes that's there from the very beginning and lasts throughout our lives, constantly being shaped and modeled. So when I talk about active inference, I just want to get clear on some of the terms I'm going to use um, and how they relate to selfhood. Um, I think in the classic predictive process or classic predictive coding specifically, um, when back when we started thinking about predictive um, mechanisms in the brain, we were focused primarily on perceptual inference, where we would change our mental model to match the world. So you can think about this as like watching a TV screen. It's a fairly passive process. If you see something that you don't expect, then you change your expectations. But actually, and very importantly, when we're looking at representing selves, particularly the new and improved predictive processing. So I'm going to contrast predictive coding with predictive processing. And I'll prim primarily use the second term. Um, I'm talking about then the addition of the active inference option uh, to this kind of uh, uh, predictive mechanisms. And what I mean by that is that 
not only do you change your mental model to match the world when you get prediction error, but you also have the choice of changing the world to match your mental model. So you interact with the things that you're perceiving, you interact with other hidden causes, and you can get feedback from that process. So when you get prediction error in, then you have two choices. You can either change your expectation to match the world, or you can change the world to match your expectation. So this is particularly important for selves because we have this reflexive feedback-driven, evidence-driven um, uh, representation, uh, which requires you to experimentally uh, poke things in the world. So this involves an, the action perception loop, which is going to be a recurring theme in my keynote today. So if our job is to match the internal states of our cognitive systems with the hidden states of the world to minimize prediction error. We only have access to the hidden states through our sensory input. Um, so uh, it's mediated by the sensory apparatus that we have. We don't have direct access to the hidden states of the world. And we can only poke the world through action. Um, so our access to the world is mediated uh, through this action and sensory input. So how does this relate to selves? Let's take an example. Let's imagine that I see myself as a really good active inference academic. Um, and one of the future states of the world um, that I perceive myself to be in uh, is writing a really good paper about active inference. So how do I make this future state that I uh, expect myself to be in come to reality, come to fruition? Um, I act, this is fairly trivial, I type on the keyboard. Um, my typing on the keyboard affects the hidden states in my computer, but this is true for all sorts of things around us, not just computers. But I don't actually understand the kind of causal mechanisms underlying all the stuff I'm doing. I don't directly interact with the code of the computer. But I do get some sensory input from my um, word processing program. But unfortunately, as all academics, I'm sure, uh, my first couple sentences and the first draft of my paper is usually not a really good paper about active inference. So I've got some prediction error, some difference between my expected future state and the state of the world at the moment, which is causing prediction error. And of course, as a, a good organism, my job is to minimize prediction error, or that's what my brain naturally does. So one way that I can do this is by continuing to write. So continuing to edit um, or write a new paper, uh, and so to act on those hidden states in order to try and minimize the mismatch by bringing about a better sensory input that more closely matches my internal state. Now notice the thing that makes my self-representation true um, is my ability to close this loop and minimize prediction error. So what grounds my inference that I'm a good academic, that my self-perception, my self-concept is true, um, are my actions and how effectively I can minimize prediction error in this loop. So another option for me if I can't minimize this prediction error is to totally abandon this expectation of myself as being a really good academic who writes good papers about active inference. So I think another really exciting uh, development in the predictive processing space is the new avenues in for understanding psychiatric conditions. Um, and there are a bunch of people who have applied the predictive processing uh, models to autism particularly, which I think are making really interesting uh, roads into uh, understanding the cognitive architecture in autism. But I wanted to give you a little taster from the perspective of an autistic person themselves. So I'm going to show you a little quote from an autistic woman, Leanne Holiday Wiley, um, who wrote in her autobiography, the human saga is just not reliable enough for me to predict. Social situations are not the only thing I find unreliable and hence untrustworthy and uncomfortable. My sense of visual perception often plays tricks on me making it difficult for me to do ordinary tasks. Generally speaking, I know I should not rely on my own visual perception, but practically speaking, it's sometimes impossible to rely on anything else. And there are a few things I wanted to pull out of this quote um, from this autobiography. One is that prediction um, and uncertainty or minimizing uncertainty uh, across lots of different um, contexts seems really important to her sense of her own cognition and perception. Um, and that this is not restricted to social situations, which is what most autism research has focused on so far. 
Um, so she extends it to visual perception, which I would also say, um, well, we should listen to people who experience it, but I totally agree uh, that uh, a lot of autism is not just in social situations, but also in uh, perception and action and behavior. Um, and that this plays a really big role in her life, um, that it is really meaningful for her to understand uh, the, the difficulty she's having with prediction or that that plays a really big role in her lived experience. So if I say that um, selves are just another hidden cause and autism might be related to differences in predictive processing mechanisms, then we might expect that um, autistic selves would present differently um, than neurotypical selves. So we did a big review of over 100 papers in cognitive science uh, with different um, paradigms to try and understand selves in autism. And we found differences across most domains of cognition. So for example, we found that autistic people generally show a reduced memory for self, reduced attention to their own name, a developmental delay in mirror self-recognition, a difference in cue integration and the rubber hand illusion, which is about the bodily representation of the self, difficulties in interoception, so understanding your own kind of internal signals, which relates to a high prevalence of alexithymia, uh, which is the inability to name and recognize your own emotions, and a reduced and less accurate use of pronouns. And when I say that, I mean primarily the use of the word I to refer to oneself. Now, I want to stop here for a second and uh, give you a little puzzle to think about for the rest of the talk, which hopefully I'll answer at the end. Um, and that is, uh, how do we explain fidgeting under active inference? So fidgeting, like clicking pens, uh, tapping your foot, you'll probably be doing it for the rest of my talk now. Um, you might think that autistic people fidget more often. So they call it stimming in the community. Um, it's a self-stimulatory actions. And you can think of it as kind of a more frequent or more socially unacceptable form of fidgeting. So the same kinds of explanations I think apply for stimming and a neurotypical person fidgeting. And the question, the reason this is a little bit of a puzzle is it seems like if all action is explained as a way to minimize prediction error, how do we explain actions like fidgeting that don't seem to give us more information about the environment? We're not manipulating elements of the environment in order to learn about them. And we're not seeming to get any kind of pragmatic reward. So I'll come back to this at the end, keep it in mind, try not to fidget too much <laughs> throughout the talk. Um, but just as a kind of introduction, trying to find a way into fidgeting might help us uh, understand a bit more about autism and how active inference works. So the focus of my talk today is going to be on two experiments about self-inference in uncertain environments. Um, and traditionally, when we look at uh, acting in uncertain environments, we have two primary reasons to act. The first is acting for reward or pragmatic gain. So for example, grabbing an apple off the tree is uh, acting to obtain some reward that maintains your homeostasis. The other way that we usually talk about acting is acting for information. And when we're talking about acting for information in this kind of literature, usually we're talking about um, acting to find out whether there is reward for your future self in a certain environment. Um, so is there uh, a lot of apples on this tree or should I go over to that tree because there are more apples there? So this is kind of classic foraging literature. But I want to say that there's something more fundamental that, than either acting for reward or acting for information about the availability of reward. Um, and that's acting to figure out what we can control in the environment. So acting in order to make agency inferences. So to fiddle with stuff in the world and figure out what I can control. Um, and if you can't do that, then you probably can't act for a reward very easily. You can't act for information very easily. You have to first map your actions to their outcomes. So I'm going to talk about these two experiments. The first was published in Cognition earlier this year. The second is on uh, the archive. Um, and hopefully tell you a bit more about agency inferences in uncertain environments. So if we go back to the action perception loop, one really nice way to access the action perception loop in uh, experimentally is through a judgment of agency. So this kind of task asks, asks participants, which of the sensory inputs should I attribute to my actions? Um, it asks them to infer I did that. 
But as we all know, especially in this field, uh, the connections between actions and hidden states and hidden states and sensory input is not quite as precise and neat and clean as we would perhaps like it to be. We live in a noisy world and there's a lot of environmental uncertainty out there. There's probably also uncertainty on this side of our action perception loop, but for today I'm going to focus on environmental uncertainty. So the, these two experiments are going to look at uh, participants making a judgment of agency in an uncertain environment to try and understand this action perception loop a bit better. So I'm going to show you a video of the task. Um, hopefully it works. <laughs> the participants task was to look at the, the screen and figure out which of these eight squares they could control with their mouse. Um, they had, other than that, pretty free range movement across the whole screen. Um, the edges of the screen kind of wrap around, so they kind of have endless space to move around in. Um, the, they can make choices about how they do the task. Uh, basically, the idea is just explore this two-dimensional space um, and tell us which, which square you controlled. Because you're not controlling the square, I've got a little line in the middle of the screen which indicates the direction and speed of movement. Um, so if the line is longer, they were moving faster. If it was shorter, then they moved a bit slower. So see if you can figure out which of those squares this participant is moving. So now they're moving to the left uh, and left, right, left. Right. So all of the squares are kind of jittering around a little bit, but the square that they're controlling should move the or follow the movement of the mouse. I'll show you one more time. Uh, put your answer in the chat for which one you think the participant is controlling. So it's a little bit harder uh, when you're not actually intervening on the underlying causal mechanisms, uh, but see if you can figure it out. Uh, I'll give you doubly the chance of uh, participant. And you can see my cat lab underneath. All right, so I see a bunch of oranges in the chat. And you are correct. So this is the underlying uh, data that we get from a trial like that. Uh, in the top left hand corner, I've got the variability. So this is how much jitter was in each of those squares movements. It's the same across all the squares, including this square, which is the me square that the participants were trying to find. Um, and that also changes during the trial. This is another video, so I'll show you how that works. Um, so that's our variability and volatility manipulation, which I actually won't talk a lot about today other than they're acting in an uncertain environment. So if you're interested in that, uh, check out the paper. Um, we also see in all of the distractor squares, there's this number that's uh, an angular offset from the trajectory of the me square. So if the participant moves up and to the right, uh, square number three is going to move 99 degrees around the circle um, uh, to the left um, from where the mouse is moving. And those numbers also change three times during the trial. So those squares turn when the participant doesn't turn. Um, we see these two white boxes. Those indicate the participant's eye position. So each box is a different eye. And we see uh, from that we can infer uh, as, as uh, researchers which of the squares the participant's looking at at any moment during the trial. Um, so that's indicated by this green square um, is my algorithm trying to decide which one the participant's looking at. So let's look at how that trial looks with all of the data kind of laid on top. So we can see, uh, like I said, a really rich data set, um, including what the participant's looking at and how they're moving and how all of the stimuli on the screen are moving. We can see that they're switching around between the squares quite a bit, but they haven't quite found the correct square yet. Um, they should be watching ones with kind of small numbers close to zero, because those are the ones that are closest to their movements. Uh, and they finally land on the, the me square at the end of the trial. So when the trial ends, these num the black numbers pop up on screen and they press a button to indicate which square they thought they controlled. If they thought they controlled no square and there were trials where they controlled no, controlled no square, they pressed a zero button. So they also had that choice of response. So if we map this onto our perception action loop, we're uh, asking the participants to try and infer this hidden state of which square was the me square. They can act to intervene on that hidden state through their mouse movements. 
We can see their internal model and their current hypothesis about which square they control through the eye tracking data. And we also get information about what their sensory input is. So this is uh, focused on the square that they were controlling. So that square with the green line around it um, and is not necessarily the same as this hidden state that they're trying to infer. Um, so we get this really rich data set and participants have a lot of freedom uh, in this experimental design, which I think are both uh, really interesting additions to the existing literature. Another really interesting addition I think that this experiment allowed us to do was to measure prediction error as the trial progressed. So we can see a sensitive and dynamic uh, prediction error measure. It looks like an EEG signal over the whole trial. Um, importantly, especially for this audience, uh, this is a behavioral proxy for prediction error. So we don't measure any neural signals. Of, I mean, you could think of eye movement sometimes as neural signals, but it's we don't measure anything from the brain. Um, so. This doesn't take into account the participants' internal model of environmental uncertainty. We would expect participants to change their predictions and their priors depending on the uncertainty condition. This measure doesn't take that into account. But let me show you how we measure it. So we take the square that the participant's looking at, and wherever they move the mouse, we take that as the expected location of the square that they're looking at. So this is kind of the prior expectation of the square's movement based on lots of experience of moving mouses and seeing stuff move on screen. But of course, R squares, even the me square, doesn't move directly to this expected location. In instead, we add this variability. So the me square will just have this variability. Um, and if they're looking at the wrong square, if it's not the me square, then they'll also have this offset, which is that number, the white number that was in the middle of the distractor screens, squares. Um, so when we add this offset and variability, the actual square moves to some other location, the square that they're looking at. And we just very simply take the difference Euclidean distance between the expected location and the actual location as a dynamic measure of prediction error over the trial. Now, like I said, this experiment gives a lot of power over to the participants. And one thing that they have control over is the magnitude of this prediction error. So how can participants control the prediction error in this experiment? Uh, the first way is that they control their speed of movement. So if they don't move at all, um, then they get zero prediction error, but they also get no information about which square they're controlling. Um, because the distance here is zero and the distance here is zero and you just end up staying in the same spot. If participants move slower, this triangle is smaller, and so the prediction error is smaller. If participants move faster, then the triangle gets bigger, and the prediction error is faster. But also, participants can control the magnitude of prediction error just by choosing a better hypothesis. So if they're choosing the mean square, you eliminate all of this offset um, and just look at the variability, so that's much smaller prediction error. You can also have better and worse distractor squares, which have more and less prediction error. So those are two ways that the participant can control the prediction error in this experiment. So because we can measure prediction error, we can also look at how prediction error changes across the, or across the trial in different uh, conditions. So we take the average prediction error for all of the trials for a participant um, and look at, uh, in different conditions, how the, the uh, minimization of prediction error changes. So for example, we can look at trials where participants judged that they did not have agency versus trials where participants picked a square at the end. And we can fit a line to these averages for each participant, which look at the change in prediction error over time. And because we're particularly interested in prediction error minimization, we want to look at the slope of this line that we fit for each participant. So that's what I'll show you in this graph. Uh, because we're looking at the slope of the line, a steeper negative slope is more prediction error minimization, whereas a positive slope is uh, no prediction error minimization, there's prediction error accumulating. We're going to look at uh, not agent judgments on the left or trials where the participants judged that they were not the agent versus agent on the right. And I've also split them by accuracy in this graph. So what the results show is that when participants judge that they have agency, they minimize prediction error faster, regardless of the accuracy of their judgment. So these ones are lower, they have lower prediction error, minim uh, they have steeper negative prediction error minimization than, than the ones on the left here. 
Um, and importantly, it doesn't matter whether they were right or wrong, there's a main effect of agency here. And so this indicates to us that participants might be using something like, uh, like the prediction or minimization or the speed of prediction or minimization to judge at the end of the trial whether or not they had agency. We can also look at the prediction error pattern around particular actions of the agent, so instead or of the participant. Instead of looking at the trend across the whole trial, we can uh, time lock to particular actions that the uh, participants taken. So in this experiment, I want to focus on the hypothesis switch. So this is when a participant chooses to change their hypothesis from one square to another square based on that eye tracking data. So we can look at, uh, for an individual trial, we get some measure of prediction error over the trial, and we take all of the moments that they switched which square they were looking at, and we average uh, an epoch around each of these events, just like an ERP analysis for anyone who does EEG research. So we can see the average uh, pattern of activity around these actions that the participant's taking. And remember that the timing of these is totally up to the participant. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, like an ERP, we're going to time lock everything to the hypothesis switch, uh, look at 500 milliseconds leading up to it and 500 milliseconds after it, and we're going to see prediction error on the y-axis. And what we're interested in here is whether the hypothesis switch can be used as a pol or is being used as a policy for prediction error minimization. So if this were the case, you'd see rising prediction error, then the participants would act, which should uh, make the prediction error drop. And that's exactly what we do see. So we get this really nice peak at the time of the hypothesis switch, which is preceded by increasing prediction error and followed by decreasing prediction error. So this was really exciting. Um, and not the sort of thing that we've ever seen measured in behavioral data before. Um, so we could see that participants seem to be using this action of hypothesis switching as a policy for prediction error minimization. So two things I want you to take away from this experiment. The first is that participants seem to be using the rate of prediction error minimization to make agency judgments. So when the prediction error is going up, they tend to decide that it was not them. Whereas when the prediction error is going down, that's when they decide that it was them, whether or not they were right about this decision. And the second thing is the participants are acting to counteract rising prediction error. And in this case, it was through uh, switching their hypothesis about which square they could control. So in the second experiment I want to tell you about, it was another squares task. Um, this is newer. Uh, a newer paper, and they were deciding between four squares which one they controlled. But in this experiment, we were interested in how participants used the structures in different environments in order to infer agency, whether they could capitalize on different structures in different environments in order to inform their agency judgments. So if participants moved the mouse straight up, there were two environments on the screen. Um, and the participants couldn't see this boundary, but they knew that one half of the screen was water and one half of the screen was sand. Um, and they were trained a little bit uh, or instructed as to what the difference between the two was. So in the sand environment, moving up and to up straight, uh, is, uh, we add to that unpredictable variability. So just like in the last experiment, uh, on every frame, there was some distribution around the trajectory of the mouse movement. Um, and we kind of jittered the square around uh, that trajectory that was input into the, into the system. So this is just like the last uh, experiments kind of jitter and variability. The difference in the water environment is that there was some uh, hierarchical deeper structure in the pattern of the variability. So the, pre uh, the direction of the variability was predictable. So for example, in this illustration, we have two frames where the participant was pushed to the left of where they moved then two frames where they were pushed to the right and then left and then right. So if the participants properly modeled these waves um, or the pattern, then they could gain something um, or minimize more uh, uncertainty about um, the consequences of their movement. But by our prediction error measure, the behavioral prediction error measure, the two environments were equivalent because the difference between where they expected to be and where they actually ended up was the same. It was just the sign um, that became predictable. So we were looking at the policies that uh, participants use to infer agency um, in this kind of more structured environment setup. 
So if we map this onto our action perception loop, there were two things that we changed from the last experiment. The first is obviously the addition of this environmental structure, uh, which affects the movement of the squares. And the second thing we changed was that the current hypothesis was now uh, measured using a button press. Um, and I can talk more about that in question time if you're interested. But basically, the pandemic happened and we had to collect data online. So we changed uh, the current hypothesis measurement to a button press instead of the eye tracking. So we were looking at environment related policies and we had these two environments, one with predictable variability that required more model complexity in order to make use of the prediction predictableness. Um, and the other, which was the sand environment, which had this unpredictable variability, had more irreducible uncertainty, but uh, didn't require as complex a model for the participants to uh, navigate it. So we were, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is whether participants use switching between environments, just mere switching, um, as a policy to minimize prediction error. So whether if we do that same kind of analysis where we look at the prediction error over time and we time lock it to the times where they cross that environmental boundary, either through the middle or around the outsides, whether we also see that same pattern of prediction error minimization around the environment switches. So in this uh, graph, I'm going to show you the true boundary crossings, which is the same kind of graph I showed you before in blue. And we've got a control in this uh, version of the experiment, which is a null permutation. Um, and I can talk a bit more about that in question time also. So we've time locked everything to the environment switch this time. This is the policy that we're interested in. We look at uh, the frames before and after. This is the same temporal duration as the last experiment. And we've got prediction error on the y-axis. <laughs> So we're looking to see whether if there's rising prediction error, the participants seem to act to change it, to, to reduce the prediction error. Um, and again, the participants had full control over when they switched environments. So we could really look at the pattern leading up to and following it, uh, this kind of free decision. So again, we see this really nice uh, peak at the time of the action, which is significantly different from this control condition. Um, so the, the switching environments crossing from uh, one environment to the other is preceded by an increase in prediction error and followed by a dramatic decrease. And of course, uh, because a lot of my work is about autism and understanding autism through a predictive processing lens, in both of these experiments we had uh, a measure of autism traits. So this is just a questionnaire. Um, low AQ indicates that the participants had fewer autism traits, and high AQ indicates the participants had more autism traits. And we can split those nice peaks that we saw around hypothesis switches and environment switches by the participants' autism traits uh, score. So let's see what that looks like. Now, this was really exciting when I found it. Um, we see this really nice. Uh, differentiation at the time of the action, particularly um, between participants with different autism traits scores. So this shows that participants with low autism traits across both these different experiments and both these different policies um, seem to act at a higher prediction error, um, whereas participants with high autism traits act when the prediction error is lower. So what this means, because we've time locked everything to the action, you can think of it instead as autistic people or people with high autism traits acting earlier in response to rising prediction error. So if we think of the prediction error as increasing, the time at which the participants with high autism traits act is earlier than the time when low autism traits participants act. So it's like they're tolerating less uncertainty before they intervene to try and minimize it. Um, this is really cool because there were lots of differences between these two experiments. So even though we saw this really striking similarity in the pattern of the data, remember that the action that we were measuring was different. It was uh, hypothesis switches versus environment switches. The way we measured prediction error was different. We had this button press, which was much more intentional and manual and disjointed versus the eye tracking, which was much smoother, had a lot more kind of uh, subconscious processes going on, um, but also that we could measure this at home and in the lab with eye tracking. 
So I think uh, it's it's usually really exciting when you see kind of replications like this, but it was especially exciting to me because we had changed so much and it seems like a really general um, finding. So if we go back to fidgeting as an active inference puzzle, you've probably forgotten all about that by now. Um, but I asked you at the beginning, if all action is explained as a way to minimize prediction error, how do we explain um, actions like fidgeting that don't give us more information about the world or reward pragmatic gain? And what I would say is that fidgeting is just another one of these actions that we perform when uncertainty is rising, when we're getting rising prediction error. So the idea is that when the rate of prediction error is not what we expect, then we get rising uncertainty about our model. Um, so we no longer believe that our model is doing an adequate job at minimizing prediction error. And so we act um, in order to try and minimize that prediction error. We do these self-stimulatory self repetitive actions. Um, and the reason we choose these is because across, we've learned across all sorts of contexts in our lives um, they do the same thing. They result in the same kind of expected uh, sensory consequences. The kinds of actions that we choose have a very tight causal loop. Um, so there's not lots of other hidden causes that are interacting with our actions. Um, we're usually like touching our own hair or a pen that we find very reliable or twiddling our fingers. So these are all things that are not usually messed with by things in the outside world. And doing these actions gives us strong predictable evidence for a continued existence or model accuracy. So the purpose of the fidgeting action, um, in my view, is to minimize rising prediction error. It's not going to solve the problem that you're having out in the world, but it will temporarily reassure you that your model is still accurate in some sense, or at least the deeper stuff. So what do I want you to take away from today? Uh, first is that participants use the rate of prediction error minimization to make agency judgments. Uh, I've got some QR codes on the right if you're interested in the details, um, but uh, also that participants act to counteract rising prediction error across a range of these different experiments um, and theoretical uh, ideas about action. So uh, hypothesis switches, environment switches, and fidgeting that autistic people might act earlier in response to rising prediction error, um, and that fidgeting under active inference might be best understood as a self-evidencing policy. So I just want to thank the organizers who invited me here today. I'm really honored to have given this keynote, and also my co-authors, Jakob Hovey, Jonah Robinson, Becky Lawson, and Sharna Jamadar, who, without whom I couldn't have done any of this research. I really appreciate their support. Thank you. OK, what an amazing talk. Um, so if anyone would like to ask questions, please go to the Q&A um, podium. Should I leave the slides up to if people need to see things, or it's is it better to take them down? Oh, okay. no, I'll leave them up. And uh, if I'm looking over here, it's because I'm looking at you, not at my screen with my slides. So <laughs> not being rude, <laughs> or not trying to be anyway. Hi. Um, Hi. That was amazing. That's oh, terrific. I almost feel like I'm at an actual conference. That's how excited I got. Um, is it not it, an actual conference? <laughs> as close as we can get them. Um, um, well, uh, first of all, is it me or is, are the results like really clean? That's like, that's it's great, right? Like, like it's <laughs> it all yeah, on the I first mean, go. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, we had a lot of participants. So in the first experiment, ah, okay. there were 40 final participants. In the second one, there were 80. Um, and we had to, especially in the second one, had to throw out a lot of participants for data quality issues. So I think the final data set is much cleaner than the kind of uh, initial, and there are lots of participants, so you end up with kind of cleaner results, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so I was, <coughs> sorry, it's a lot to take in. Yes, um, sorry. But, but, <laughs> um, but impressive nevertheless, but, but I, I was wondering about, well, first of all, the paradigm is new, right? So, so you developed this, this experimental paradigm with Howie. So um, they've, 
They've done squares tasks in um, autistic populations. So it's actually the most common uh, paradigm used for judgment of agency in autistic populations, but I haven't actually seen it outside of that literature. Mm -hmm. And the original squares tasks did not have any uncertainty. Um, and so it was a direct mapping from what the participants did to the outcomes of the squares and there was no jitter or any of that. So I think it really adds um, and they didn't do any of the prediction error stuff. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of new stuff in there, but it's not like I didn't come up with the text. No, exactly. No, because because I was wondering, like, it, it seems they have a very fertile soil to, to to branch off in, right? So, so for example, um, I was wondering if there is, is it worthwhile to explore the connection between uh, fidgeting, the sensitivity to prediction errors, and um, the, the self stimming, right? So, so, so you 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 separate the groups with the the autistic qualities, but that's like trait ones, right? So that's more. Yeah. Yeah, so we haven't um, done anything trait. in diagnostic groups or diagnosed well, groups. Well, what I mean is more like um, uh, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, autism literature, but but I was wondering if that sensitivity to the uh, changes in prediction error minimization, if, if if that is also related to agency and in turn stimming, right? So so I'm not sure how ethical it is, but you know if you could ask like uh, what what makes you feel like you lose agency and then you separate them with the group that allows them to, allow them to stim and the other. Don't allow them to see. Yeah. Is, is there something like that done before? What would you expect? Uh, no, I don't think anything like that's been done before. Um, I mean, people are with autism, autistic people tend to stim more um, in stressful and exciting environments. Um, kind of this two ends of the arousal spectrum, the same way that we uh, fidget in, in when we're bored and when we're uh, into something. Um, and I think that has to do with the, the rate of prediction error minimization in both those cases not being what we expect. So either it's easier or harder than we expected uh, prediction error minimization to be. Um, but I've, I have struggled to come up with ways of experimentally testing the fidgeting hypothesis because I think it's so individual. How do you like ensure that participants are experiencing something that they didn't expect to experience um, so that they're going to use this kind of uh, broad context, uh, non-specific um, action to try and minimize it. Um, but yeah, no, I'm fascinated by the Just idea of following it up. One small final question, because this is really fascinating. Yeah. So, so how how central or how 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 big an effect is, is the relation between the how big is the, how strong is the relation between the sense of agency in, for autistic people uh, and the sensitivity to prediction errors? So we don't find, one thing I didn't say in this is that we don't find a difference in accuracy of the agency judgments depending on autism traits. So it's not like autistic people aren't experiencing agency. And actually, uh, the one of the only domains we didn't find a difference in our review was judgments of agency for autistic people. So it's not like the final judgment is changing, but the behavior, the way that they're inferring the agency seems to be different. Um, so it's, I, yeah, I don't want people to come away from this thinking that autistic people don't feel agency or something. It's just that no, the no. way that they do, the way that they in, uh, act to make inferences about themselves is different. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So thank you for that talk. It was really nice. Um, and I have a few probably uh, nitpicky questions. So and maybe mm -hmm. I should just go read the uh, the, the paper that you <laughs> posted. But the um, so I guess you kind of answered one of them already. So you said forty people for the first experiment that ended up being in the final uh, yep. paper, right? And then eighty yep. for the second one. Yeah. And what what was the because uh, I remember that you had it I guess categorized by traits, right? Like high high yep. amount of autistic traits and so forth. Yep. How did how did that come about? Like, what was the designation for that? Yeah, so we took uh, the mean and then uh, one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean and used those as cutoffs for the groups. Um, so there are more people in this middle group than the two others, but they're defined by how far away they are from the mean okay. on the autism traits. In, in those little uh, vertical bars, is that kind of a confidence yeah. level? Yes. Yeah, 95% confidence level. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you die, ask you less than 0.5, I guess, but there is overlap, right? So I see that there's, uh, you know, yeah. so, uh, so if you, know, you do, high and, if you do, go ahead. sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. No, by all means. I was going to say, if you do a, a, um, 
correlation or regression on this central time point, you get a linear effect of uh, autism traits on the uh, prediction error at the time of action. Okay, cool. And then I guess, uh, did you guys calculate the statistical power of the tests as well, or is that kind of just not? No, we didn't. Yeah, you know, I think that it was a little bit too, too difficult to do, given that it's like there were so many measures in the task and none of them had really been done before. So we didn't really do a power analysis. But um, yeah, I think the fact that it replicates across these two uh, experiments is meaningful. Oh, yeah, and definitely gives you avenues for, like, for the research. And, yeah. um, and I guess the, the, was there a measure of effect size, the Cohen's D or something else that y'all used? Or? Uh, I think we do have some in the paper, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. I'm sorry. All right. about that. No, no worries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I guess, um, did you post a link somewhere, I guess, uh, in the chat? Or maybe I can find that. On to the, the papers? Time. Yeah. Um, so. The main ones I talked about, uh, I've got QR codes here, so I'll leave those up for a second. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks no worries. Again. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kelsey. Uh, thanks very much for a very stimulating presentation there. I, I like the graphics and uh, the experimental modeling uh, was awesome. Now, you mentioned the notion of pragmatic rewards earlier, and it came up in the fidgeting exercise. Uh, um, what I'm curious to find out is like the whole notion of rewards and information. You mentioned control. Uh, how, how does the dynamic nature of these values, like or something that may be rewarding uh, in an instant may not be rewarding in another instant? Um, the dynamic values of rewards, uh, uh, how do you model that? Uh, and then, and then, just how do you contrast those dynamic values with more static uh, types of traits? Um, that's my question. Sorry, we're cutting in a, a little bit. Um, I heard the dynamic versus static rewards, um, and asking about the pragmatic rewards uh, that I was talking about. Uh, would you mind repeating the the question? Sure. Uh, I was talking about uh, those notion of the notion of rewards that you mentioned. I uh, you mentioned that uh, information can also be something that has a value and control yeah. and agency over a process. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that the values of rewards are are not always static. They're dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so, right. And I'm also saying that there are other static attributes, like traits, that are also at play in models. So I wanted yes. to find out like how do you how do you handle the dynamic transitions of rewards and those values? Yeah, I definitely don't think that existing research does it uh, very well, or at least not in the detail that we would want for like the predictive processing theory of like rewards end up being mostly about prediction error minimization. It, uh, the theory kind of collapses across the, inf the value of information and the value of pragmatic rewards in some ways. Um, and so there's definitely uh, context specific reward um, the magnitude of the roar d differs depending on con contextual information and the individual, right? Um, so I, I um, definitely think there's avenues there for more research, but I'm not sure that my stuff really gets at that. Thank you. And that's why I found it really hard to test, or in, in my mind, I think it's really hard to test the fidgeting. Uh, you can find a lot of correlational things um, that supported the theory, but I think uh, empirically testing the fidgeting hypothesis is is difficult, uh, convincingly, for partially that reason. Right. So, in terms of how you how you structure the experiment, is 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 a, a preset to define your behavioral your behavioral prediction error metric. 
or how like can you explain like that part which is like yeah. how do you structure your experiment in order yeah. to have a predefined uh behavioral prediction error metric yeah so we in this experiment we were not we didn't design the experiment to pull the, the manipulation in the experiments in the first one was about uh, variability and volatility. So I didn't talk about this, but we had a low variability condition and a high variability condition, and we had low volatility and high volatility, and we had a two by two design. So the primary kinds of things that we set out when we designed that experiment were about looking at differences in different uncertainty conditions. But of course, because we were measuring prediction error and we were interested in how participants make a judgment of agency and act in these environments in order to minimize prediction error, that's the part that I focused on today. Um, so we, we didn't design it with, so parts of our design lead to differences in prediction error, like the variability necessarily has a, an effect on our behavioral prediction error measure, but it wasn't, uh, we didn't force that in the agency judgments. Does that make sense? Um, yes, yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Kelsey, for, for your talk. It was, it was awesome. And, um, my question is related with prediction error um, and agency, um, because sometimes we can uh, know we are the authors of the sensory consequences um, of actions, uh, even if they generate a lot of prediction error. So we can have like a big mismatch and we'll still know we made it. <laughs> so yeah. um, how how can be, we can be sure that um, participants were actually taking into consideration prediction error minimization or um i don't know maybe temporal contingencies um yeah 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 so i think the traditional views of agency are around this comparator model which deals with the that issue yeah. uh, even worse than a than a an active inference approach to prediction or, or to agency um so under the active inference uh, or predictive processing accounts of agency uh, you judge agency when you uh, believe that you can reach um, an outcome through your actions so you have like precise policy mappings um, which is a bit different to the comparator model which is about the difference between the outcome that you expected and the outcome that you actually perceive um, the reason we think that we have or we, i think we have evidence that participants are using the um, the predict predictionary make this judgment. And I, the reason I think that is because of this, um, the participants, the, um, when participants choose that they are the agent, when they make this judgment at the end that they are the agent, however, they make that in their heads, um, it's related to a decrease in the gradient of prediction error over the trial. And this is whether they're right or wrong. So if they correctly choose the correct square, then they have the lowest prediction error minimization, uh, significantly different here. Um, but also when they're wrong. So when they say they have agency, but actually chose the wrong square, which kind of to me implies that it's not about the reality uh, of the the agency that they experienced, but rather their perception or beliefs about the uh, agency that they experienced, which is what leads them to make this judgment at the end, um, rather than this kind of objective, whether they were right or wrong. Um, and this changes, the prediction error gradient changes depending on the judgment that they're making. Uh, okay, oh, th thank you. That's that's like a, a perfect answer. I was oh, looking for, and, and, and last, uh, Kelsey, do you think that, um, the same way you ask us um, like to search for the, the, the square that was being moved by the participant. Um, do you think that this data could differ if we are just like an observer or actually being the one that is moving actively the square? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, even just from experiencing the videos, 
Uh, I don't need to show it again. But even from just experiencing the videos, it takes you much longer to figure out the perceptual uh, from as just a perceptual task, which square the participants are controlling, even though it's just a visual matching between the kind of uh, movement of that line and their uh, the squares movements. Whereas when you're acting, you get this kind of, it's like being a scientist, you can like intervene on the causal process that you're hypothesizing, which gives you much more informative information and you can actively test the hypothesis that you have rather than just experiencing kind of a mess of things and trying to uh, sort it out in your head. So yeah, I think there's a big difference between uh, doing that task as perceptual inference and doing it in an active inference kind of way. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. And it's an amazing um, experimental paradigm. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Um, hey, so uh, there was an, a question by um, by Shannon in the chat. There were several questions in the chat during your, your talk. Um, I'm looking for it. She said, did only the, the movement of the squares change or the perturbations introduced on the mouse trajectory as well? Um, so in the first experiment, there were different blocks. And in the different blocks, there were different uncertainty uh, combinations. So in that way, the perturbations on the mouse and all of the other squares, so the variability affected all of the stimuli equally. Um, we, we did manipulate that in that experiment. Um, so yeah, uh, in some cases, the perturbation of the square changed as well. Thank you, Shannon. Did you have any additional? Oh, she also said thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So then uh, I guess if, if no one else, I, I did have a question. Um, you, you mentioned that they had an earlier action given some prediction error, at least specifically that the, they were more sensitive to prediction error and thus acted earlier. And I was wondering if it also entailed that potentially um, they made connection or they made causal pathways faster, um, which potentially linked different kinds of actions towards different kinds of towards a consequence. Uh, yeah, definitely, possibly, um, definitely, possibly. Uh, <laughs> that's not a very good answer. But uh, one of the theories of um, autism from the predictive processing view is that they, uh, ha most of them boil down to a, a, a higher learning rate. And some of them um, have claimed that uh, autistic people have a higher expectation for volatility. So essentially they're throwing out their model and replacing it more often. Um, which I think is also consistent with this kind of action um, that they're more act more often intervening to try and confirm that their model is still true. Um, so definitely, yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Kelsey. Does anybody else have any more questions for Kelsey? Oh, Marco has a question. I think you're muted, Marco. Sorry. <coughs> um, very small question. Just curious because some other people also mentioned the comments. Um, so are you like also a graphic designer or like a teacher <laughs> or like a pedagogic <laughs> wizard or something? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's very flattering. I, I do art in my spare time. So I paint uh, as a hobby and I really enjoy doing the visual side of academia. So. Uh, I'm not a graphic designer, but I do have a little bit of training in artistic in stuff. In the realm of academia, <laughs> you, you would definitely be a graphic designer. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, so I, I know there's a lot more questions possibly, but we are at the end of, of today's uh, conference. If you have any questions you wanted to, to ask Kelsey, I suggest either you go talk to her if she's still available today or send an email. Uh, I know that maybe you you're, maybe you want to share an email or, or just stuff. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I'm also on Twitter if you prefer Twitter, but. <laughs> Uh, so I'm also happy to stick around. Yeah.